So, um, Vicky, um, you and I sit in, in the clinic, and one of um, the things that I think our questions, uh, our, our audience find difficult and our people at home find difficult is um, deciding what sort of neurological symptoms and signs uh, might be something that denotes a, a major neurological problem. And I might wonder if you might share some of your thoughts. Can you hear me? It's working. Um, I think the first thing to say is that everyone um, with, you know, NF or not, experiences fleeting neurological symptoms all the time, you know, waking up with a numb arm or a tingly leg, and most things aren't significant. So I would say that the things, I think, to bring to attention are symptoms that seem to build over days or weeks, are persistent, that you recognize as unusual or troubling. Um, we're very fortunate, and I hope everyone in this room is fortunate in having contact with um, NF nurse specialists who are there to sort of talk through any worrying symptoms. And I would say it's always better to bring something to medical attention if you're concerned. But if something is, is you know, fleeting and, and intermittent and disappears by itself, and it is very, very likely not to be of any worrying source. Have any of you um, had problems where um, you've had a neurological symptom and people haven't taken it seriously? Would you like to use the microphone behind you? <laughs> yeah, I've well, I got a good question. Why do I get the pain in my arm where it feels it's on fire and it feels like it's in a vice being squeezed and somebody's taking a torch and going up and down and it comes at random? So the question was why he's getting pain in the arm and it feels like a vice. Sometimes there's a, a sort of discrete neurofibroma that's causing pressure on a nerve. Um, and sometimes in that situation, if there is pressure, you know, something can be done to, to relieve that. More often, there's a sort of general change within the nerve itself that extends beyond anything that can be seen just on a straightforward scan. We know that there can be a sort of diffuse... Yeah, they've done scans, they don't see anything half yeah. the time. I don't think they know what they're looking for because there's no mm. real specialist no. Well, often in there Tampa. Isn't, sorry to interrupt you. Often there isn't an actual lump that can be removed. It's just that the nerve itself is thick. And if you could look at it under a microscope, you might be able to see that the nerve mm. structure is slightly abnormal. And in that situation, it's more a question of management pain management techniques and we have um, I know later on today some talks about about pain management so there are medications there are psychological ways of, of managing pain so <laughs> I think often a, a you know really good pain specialist is, is can be vitally important well, all, all my pain specialists just want to give me drugs narcotics mm. right yeah. um, Pierre did you have any um, other comments for this gentleman Yes, uh, in France, when we performed a survey uh, on uh, patients with NF1, we had at least 10% of uh, people that had pain. So your case is not uh, a, a single case. It's clearly something that is relatively frequent. But uh, as you told us, it's very difficult to treat because uh, when there is no lump or tumor, it's uh, the nerve itself that is... Uh, abnormal and you cannot uh, see it without uh, a biopsy and, uh, and a biopsy is sometimes a sample that you can miss the place where is the, the neurofibroma or the abnormality of the, of the nerve. I, I just want to mention again what I thought was interesting and this is all just based on us looking at the data but we did see improvement in pain in some of the patients who have plexiforms fairly early, within a week or two sometimes, they would tell us the pain is getting better and we do see the shrinkage, the best shrinkage maybe after a year. So there's a question if there's a mechanism, you know, maybe even if the nerve is involved, as you just said, possibly if this was to be a successful treatment down the road, something that blocks MEC could potentially provide some pain relief as well. And I would just say that only because you mentioned that there are a lot more classes of drugs that treat pain than narcotics that I think we all use. I, I'm sure. So I think you might be interested in uh, Dr. Williams' talk that's 
going to think about different uh, ways of coping with pain. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Okay, I have um, plexiform neurofibromas growing on my brachial plexus, which I've lost the use of my arm. I do take gabapentin for the pain in my hand, and I started um, a lidocaine patch that I wear at night. But I was just wondering what is available, because they're saying surgery is not an option, and so it's like, what do I do? <laughs> Obviously, uh, there are different things available for pain. Uh, gabapentin is a very good one. I, again, um, do you guys want to share some of that? Pierre, do you want to start? And then uh, Vicky? I was going to say that, I mean, obviously, uh, drug management, but in, in sort of physical ways of managing, um, and then may, may be helpful. I mean, if you have weakness around the shoulder, then that puts extra strain on the normal tissues, on the ligaments and the muscles, and you can get secondary causes of pain from that. So. I've had patients who've had really excellent results from good physiotherapy, splinting, even functional electrical stimulation of, of, of muscles, really to try and, you know, help su support the, the limb, as well as just focusing on, on, on medication. I think that's important to see a good physical therapist. I, I think you said you were denied in the clinical trial, so maybe after the talk we can just exchange and I can go back to NIH and look at your information if we have it and get back with you to see if that is a yeah, possibility. Yeah, because I, I think the important thing that you mentioned to us was that uh, the selumetinib is, is something that's impacting on pain. I think, Dr. Volkenstein, you did a very small study uh, on another drug that you thought might be helpful for pain. Is that right? Um, Which one? The rapamycin? Bordeaux, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. So, so, so I was only thinking about the equivalence of the pain for dermatology that is pruritus. And, uh, Sorry? That is pruritus. Yeah, so itching. Um, itching. Yeah, so itching is put down as a neurological problem. Do, do, how many people here get problems with itching or have... Yeah. And it, it's a real difficulty. Um, What's your um, solution to people who may have problems with itching? For us in dermatology in the referral center, we think and we demonstrated that the number of neurofibromas was uh, probably uh, uh, the main risk of uh, itching. The second point is that when you remove these neurofibromas, you will decrease the the risk of itching. So I would say that first dermatological surgery is probably uh, the way to, to decrease, yes, uh, the, the risk and the itching. And the second point is that we have usual way to treat itching, that is uh, the so-called uh, antihistaminic treatment. So that's uh, a possibility. But you, you, you should also probably in your trials look at that kind of uh, I would say, uh, good secondary effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a very, as I'm sure you're going to tell me, it's a very disabling symptom. So I just want to move on a for a little bit um, to Dr. Payne. Um, and we were talking very briefly about learning. And, and what's been told me uh, by many uh, parents is um, that they have you have a state-of-the-art unit where you assess your children. But what would you say to parents who feel that their child has a learning problem, and somebody told me this a couple of days ago, and their local school is not taking it seriously? What do you and Dr. Lesnick do in those cases? Well, I think the most important thing is to have a good relationship with the appropriate person at the, can you, can at the school. So the learning, like a lot of the other um, issues that you've been hearing about today, is quite variable in NF1. And you have children that, that go along and, and perform quite well at school. But at the other hand, you have children that do struggle quite a lot. And, and I was saying that the most important thing, I think, is to have a good relationship with the appropriate person at the school. And I think what happens in Australia is probably going to be quite a bit different as to what happens in the US. I'm not sure if it's, there's a sta different state-based um, criteria as well for, for school-based funding. 
Um, but a lot of children in Australia um, miss out on funding because they don't fit the, the requisite criteria. We need to have an IQ below 70 to, to get funding or to have a, a severe language disorder. And quite often they're not the problems that um, children with NF1 present with. They have reading difficulties, they have attention difficulties that significantly impact on their ability to learn. Um, but that's not unfortunately fundable. So it's really important to have a, a close relationship with the appropriate person at the school, identify who that person is, um, and try and set up meetings to try and get a, an individual learning plan for your student. Do you have any comments for that because you are the homegrown doctor here? Well, I think our, I bet our problems are much harder in the US. I mean, for one thing, um, we have parents who, do, who don't want to disclose that their child is NF1. I'm sure that the, um, for fear of stigmatization, that's one issue. We have educators who don't know anything about NF1. Um, that's a second issue. We have parents whose kids are homeschooled, who are in private schools, um, where they don't have the resources that the, um, that the public schools have, but the public schools, like in Chicago, have 30 children per classroom. And the kids who might have ADHD who are inattentive, who just sit there and don't create a behavior problem, they fly under the radar. So it really does take a parent sitting there, taking their shoe off like Khrushchev, hammering on the table getting to insist that, they, that um, the, their kid gets what they want. You're all nodding. I'm sure you've been through that. And we have parents who have actually gotten lawyers. For those that don't know, there are lawyers who specialize in just this problem, getting kids the appropriate educational resources in state-funded schools. So it's a huge issue. Would anybody uh, want to tell us if they've been successful or what sort of problem they've had? Because a lot of you were nodding. <laughs> you were nodding. <laughs> Do you, would you mind very much using the microphone? It's just behind you. It's good to hear a success story. No, so my son is still young. He's starting kindergarten, but he's had a service and an IEP since he was um, 11 months old for a lot of developmental delays. Um, but we've been very successful uh, in New York getting the services that we need. Um, and I think it's because he has the official diagnosis. He kind of falls right at the bottom of the normal curve. Um, but because of the diagnosis, what we've seen is that he's been very successful. But I'm also an educator, so I know you, know, you can bring an advocate with you to those meetings, and you can table the meeting if you're not happy with what you're hearing. So that's just you know, recommendations if you are having problems to look for those advocates and to try to find those people who can help you. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. That's, um, really, that's really helpful for me, because my daughter is in kindergarten, and we're gonna restart kindergarten this next year, and they, even though I went in saying, um, you know, this is what my daughter has, and giving them all the educated brochures about neurofibromatosis, um, they just kept, she just kept going under the radar, and finally I saw that she was getting no services halfway through the year, and spoke up and demanded something, but they still won't give me an IEP. It's just really interesting how, um, and she's at public school, um, it's interesting how because she's just on the low end of normal, they just keep neglecting her services. So I'm really struggling right now and kind of at a boiling point. I don't know how to go forward. Well, one thing you can do, I think, I mean, if it depends upon your insurance and if you can pay out of pocket, is get a complete neuropsychological profile like what Dr. Payne can do and bring it to them and say, look, this is what's going on. Mm -hmm. I demand that you deal with it. Yeah. yeah. So she did get the whole profile services through well, the school. Well, but that's you can not get good. it through the school. Got to do it privately. Well, no, you can get it through the school. Um, I'm, in my experience, you'll get even a more complete one if you go see a neuropsychologist. Yeah. Um, okay. But then you have to pay for it. Okay. So well, how much do those things run typically? Oh, I have. I have how no much? Idea. I have no idea, but I'm, I'm sure it's not okay. cheap. Okay. It's not cheap. So, um, Jonathan, okay. could you just? Um, very briefly, tell people before we take our next uh, question, what sort of things are involved in doing a neuropsychological assessment? Yeah. So, again, I'll talk from an Australian perspective. When a child gets assessed at a school, typically they get <laughs> an IQ test 
which is a, me a measure of intelligence. It's a sort of overall um, score for somebody's general thinking and reasoning skills. Now, a lot of children with NF1, in fact, the majority of them are, are, are within normal limits. They're towards the lower end, but they're within the normal range. So that score doesn't necessarily help because these children have functional and learning problems. So what a neuropsychological assessment does is it goes into some of the more specific cognitive areas such as attention, executive functioning, which are these frontal lobe skills that are to do with planning an organisation and being able to control and inhibit behaviour. Um, and some of them might look at social skills, they, they might look at visuospatial skills and language as well. So it gives a much more thorough and in-depth um, profile on a child which can then lead to some recommendations for, for the school. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, my son Travis, we have a success story with the schools and IAP. Um, he has a physical disability with NF in addition to learning disability, so we're open with the school. And what really helped us, I think he had an IAP when he was little, we identified that and we're fortunate. Uh, but we did, we've seen a neuropsychologist uh, twice, and she actually will come to the IEP meetings. We actually pay for her, and every three years they do a reassessment, and we had one, and she was there, like, nope, these are hiccups, this is what's going on. And the school's been great. You know, if we drop something and they need to bring it back in, we've been really, really lucky. And so do you have a sort of group within CTF that push forward, give leaflets to schools, just uh, give each other support? I think our volunteer leaders do that um, really well. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to volunteer in clinic and talk to families and hand out educational brochures. Um, as a CTF volunteer, I do not go to IEP meetings, but the state of Utah has Utah Parent Center, and they have advocates that will go and stand in IEP meetings with everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. So we take one more question and then move on to a slightly different topic. I actually just had some additional information just to add because um, my own sister has been able to kind of like help me through the process. Um, my daughter's three and so we're just getting ready to enter into preschool. But, um, you know, check in with um, some of your state resources because if you have a child under the age of three, they'll also do a free evaluation for you as well, even if they're not in the school setting. But if you're not getting the results you need at the public school setting, you need to escalate it up to the school district and even at the state level because there are certain guidelines that they're supposed to be held to. And so often a lot of those teachers do not, um, and, and, and even the including the special education teachers, um, do not follow the IEPs properly. So, you know, you're your own advocate for your child, and that's one of the things that my sister said to me, because she actually monitors all of the um, IEP um, educators in the state of Montana, so she's, she's pretty good at, you know, trying to tell me what all needs to happen, you know, for my own child. So I just wanted to be able to share that with everybody, that don't just stop at your local school, escalate. Doctor, my, my apologies, but I just want to say one thing. The focus right now has been on, on younger children. Uh, our son Connor is just finished his sophomore year in college uh, down in the state of Florida, and there are programs available. I know we've, you know we've been asking questions about scholarship programs and so forth. We have a uh, Department of Education in Florida has the Vocational Rehabilitation Program. We were interviewed for that. It took, what, almost a year and a half or so? And Connor was accepted into that, where they are paying for his entire tuition, um, books, fees, and so forth because of his disorder. Uh, we were able to successfully do that. So there are programs available for your older children with NF. Okay, well, I wanted to make everybody, everybody aware of that. I'm really glad you raised that point because, as I said earlier in my talk, we have found that 10% of our adults cannot read or write, and people hide it. Um, and it means they're late for appointments because they can't read the signs, they can't read the letters. So having an adult literacy program and help in college is amazing for self-esteem, but actually for just activities of daily living. So it, thank it, you very much for well, letting and, us know And it that. is, it, and Connor had his struggles in high, in, through grade school, with the learning disabilities. Yeah. He had his IEP yeah. and so forth, um, but in college he's excelled. And the one thing too about vocational rehabilitation, mm -hmm. they will help him find a job, and they will place him in a job after graduation. All right, so that, I mean, it's win-win. So, Thank you for right. telling us that. So um, many uh, 
of our adults um, and our teenagers are very concerned about um, the development of the skin neurofibromas. Obviously, Brigitte's brilliant work is, is focusing on the plexiform neurofibromas, but I wanted to turn to Pierre and, and also to, to, to Brigitte, but first to Pierre about how you deal with uh, people who are worried about what may happen, and then what do you do when people have significant numbers of neurofibromas, and then afterwards see what Brigitte feels? First, one of the main key questions of, of, of people is uh, what will be the number of cutaneous neurofibromas that they will have? And uh, today I must say that there is something for the dermatologist is to look at carefully to the skin and to see if it is clearly, I would say, soft or if there is something that is just slightly appearing, that is very difficult to see, it's difficult to describe. But I can tell you today that probably I can tell you if you will have a number or not but more on an intuitive approach than uh, on uh, something that is clearly to be written. The second point, uh, I would say also in my experience, uh, people with subcutaneous neurofibromas have less cutaneous neurofibromas. And the, the, the deeper you have neurofibromas, the less they will be uh, a lot of cutaneous and very uh, visible <laughs> neurofibromas. Uh, in dermatology, uh, of course, we have dermatological surgery. It's rather easy for uh, the patients to have an ambulatory uh, procedure to remove uh, surgically uh, some uh, neurofibroma. But, but when you have a number, I, I would say that today laser surgery is probably the, the best a way to remove a lot of neurofibromas and under general anesthesia. That means that you can remove, I would say, dozens and dozens of neurofibromas in one, one session. That means that uh, with two or three procedures, you can, I don't like the, the, the term, but to clean the skin. And uh, one of uh, the issues today is, is to exactly know what is the duration of uh, the results. I mean, uh, for example, in Paris, we offer uh, general anesthesia once a year for patients that have a lot of neurofibromas. And of course, it's reimbursed. But that's a way uh, it's not considered as cosmetic surgery. Thank you. So, so, so Pierre is saying that, uh, that there's clearly a major role for surgery, also uh, a role for laser. Has anybody had laser surgery? Has anybody had ordinary surgery? Is it possible to use a microphone for us? There, there's one there, sorry. Thank you. Hi, you know, I live in New York and um, my friend and I have both been to Dr. Hubert Weinberg. He's been to some of these sessions before, and he developed the electrodesiccation yeah. Yeah. that um, I've been through, and he can take off a few hundred at a time. And uh, you, he says you, you have to be very careful with the codes in order for it to be covered. I go to an outpatient surgical place that he goes to, so it's covered, you're under general anesthesia, and he takes so many off at one time. <coughs> if some of them are a little bigger, he does have to cut and stitch, but it's great. It gets great results. Thank you. Electrodesiccation? So, my, my, my question to today is how many times you have to, 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 to proceed well, well I, you can go as often, you know, as you feel you want to. I've been a couple of times. I haven't done it again. I don't feel I want to go do it now, but he's taken a lot off. Yes, that, that's my, clear. My friend can talk, too, if she wants to about yeah, it. Yes, that's clear that it's uh, something that we, we need to end the appearance of neurofibromas, and we are not able to do that. So today is the only way to... Uh, 
not to cure, but to, 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 to decrease the numbers is to destroy them. And uh, the way to destroy is not, uh, we have three possibilities. The first is to remove surgically, to destroy electrodesiccation uh, or laser surgery. That's exactly the same. But I, I think that uh, yes. maybe uh, new mech or new approach, mech inhibitors, for example, and I know that in France, for example, uh, Pierre Fab Dermatologie, uh, which is a, a, a firm uh, dedicated to uh, cancer but also to skin, wants to develop something that could be a, a topical approach of, uh, of the treatment. So, Begitta. Uh, and that's a question, though, but isn't laser more of a burning them off, whereas desiccation? Desiccation medically, in medical it, it terminology, depends, it, is drying up. It, it depends on the, on the depths of the neurofibroma, you know, because sometimes you have some things that is very superficial and uh, it's easy, but sometimes it's, it's deeper in the skin and when with a hit, you will have a, a shrinkage, an artificial shrinkage of the neurofibroma and you think that you removed all, but you did not. That means that after the healing, is, there is a bad quality of, of healing. So uh, I would, my advice would have to have devoted or dedicated laser su surgeons because it's not the same as a, a, a usual procedure that they perform with a, a laser surgery uh, in, in the cosmetic field. I think um, Dr. Volkenstein would be happy to talk to you a bit later. Um, I think you've raised a big challenge, topical treatment, Birgitta? Yeah, I think topical treatment would be wonderful because you would avoid the side effects that you could have when you take a drug by, by mouse. That would be an, could be an ultimate goal. Um, we are developing a small study with Dr. Korf in, in Alabama and Dr. Luli in UT Southwestern in Dallas and the NCI to look at the MEK inhibitor that we use for the plexiforms. Um, for dormant neurofibromas. And the first task will be, can we actually shrink these tumors? And we understand if you have many hundreds of tumors, a little bit of shrinkage may not be as meaningful, but as a proof of principle, if we knew that we could shrink the tumors, then maybe earlier treatment uh, could be a consideration. Uh, so that is a study that um, will open soon. And I, I do think there needs to be a lot more focus on um, trying to see what treatments or prevention strategies could be used for dermal tumors. And again, this afternoon, we, you know, it, we really appreciate so much getting in touch with all of you. I do especially because I see mostly children, but hearing what matters to all of you, that's very important, not only for us researchers, but ultimately for the FDA to hear, because all of these medicines will be for patients who, who have these tumors. So let us know what matters to you. Last okay. point, it does exist for tuberous sclerosis. For angiofibromas of the face, we yeah. developed a topical treatment, so it's possible. Well, it's an exciting prospect. Yes. Thank you very much. So, um, earlier on, I mentioned that Dr. Listernik um, was one of the people who spearheaded the research into optic pathway gliomas. And one of the questions chair me earlier was um, so what's the use of visual screening would you would you like to tell us a little bit more about visual screening we mentioned it briefly oh sure I mean I think those of you who have children hopefully are um, have experienced this so at least we believe I can't say that we've proven but we certainly believe that um, early detection of tumors is really important um, and uh, the visual screening, now I'm not an ophthalmologist, uh, nor do I play one on TV, but <laughs> they, um, there, are different, there are different modalities that we use um, at different ages, um, and they, you've probably experienced them. They did, you know, young two and three-year-old children can't see no letters, so they have little figures that they do. The older you get, um, there are um, the, 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 you see the four big letters, the HOTV um, for screening. And then finally, there's that chart that we're all familiar with. It's called the Snellen chart with all the various lines. There are even tests that we can use in babies and, um, and kids in the first year of life um, where there's a series of lines and looking at their, the patterns and how the babies recognize these lines to, to assess visual acuity in that age. 
So we, can, we certainly can get a good visual acuity. A, a good pediatric ophthalmologist can um, very often at six months of age. Um, and then we use the different uh, charts as the kids get older. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if you're going to ask me this, but I'll just say, again, I think it's extremely important um, as part of health maintenance. That's what I, I'm a pediatrician, so I'm all about health maintenance and to get annual eye checks um, on your kids by a pediatric ophthalmologist, so someone who knows about um, NF and optic pathway tumors and that they should be seen yearly um, for these um, uh, visual examinations. These tumors are generally, um, they, they occur in young children, so predominantly uh, six years of age and under. Um, we are, formally have recommended with CTF that kids up until 10 years of age um, get annual eye exams and then you can space them out. So, but it, I think the birth through six, seven, eight years is, is really the, 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 mo the most crucial period. Thank you very much, Bob. I mean, has, has everybody managed, who's got children, managed to get their visual screening? Did you want to comment? Hi, I just add that there's a huge difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist. Our little boy was two and a half when he got diagnosed, and I can only just say, he was born with the cafe au lait spots. We just thought they were his cute little spots. He was our little giraffe. Um, and he just didn't look at us the same. And we kept saying, he doesn't look at us. He doesn't look at us. He's looking right through us. Optometrist said, eyes are healthy. Three months later, eyes are healthy. Three months later, eyes are healthy. Got to an ophthalmologist. Eyes don't look so healthy. He's got a little astigmatism back there. He's got the list nodules. He's starting to have tremors. Do the MRI, massive optic pathway glioma. Big difference between an ophthalmolog ophthalmologist and an optometrist. So I'd get one of those on your payroll and keep with those visits. And I'll just reinforce, there's a, they're ophthalmologist and they're ophthalmologist and then they're pediatric ophthalmologist. And you know, I do think that uh, once the diagnosis is made, the kids should be seen by a pediatric ophthalmologist, and even a pediatric ophthalmologist who knows about NF, because they're gradations even amongst them. I think it, you know, you can't really stress that enough. It's the visual screening that's the important thing, rather than the MRI. It's the vision that picks them up, is that right? Yeah, I would say, you know, th th this might be mildly controversial still, and in fact, yeah. we were just talking about it, where am I, downstairs, so upstairs, wherever we were talking about it. We were talking about the, the role of MRI scans. I personally believe that we don't need screening MRI scans. In other words, doing an MRI scan on a child who looks perfectly fine and whose visual examination is fine. Um, Dr. Grant Liu, who's one of the, who's tremendous pediatric opth neuro-ophthalmologist, um, feels that kids under a year of age who he can't get a good eye exam on should have an MRI scan. It's hard to argue with that, although we don't generally do that in Chicago. But there are still clinics, very, very good clinics, that do uh, routine, I don't know whether it's yearly or every other year, MRI scans. And we really haven't proven to everybody's satisfaction that, that you shouldn't do it. That's a double negative, but okay. I believe yeah. We'll sit on the fence. <laughs> I have a quick question for you. My, um, my own daughter just got done receiving chemotherapy for her optic um, pathway glioma, and um, we're still trying to kind of figure out and get an accurate um, assessment on her vision. But can you speak to, like, do, optic or do the optic pathway gliomas um, have that visual awareness um, that I, I think the other one was talking about er earlier? Cause I can't hear. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Oh, anything. you can't hear me? I'm sorry, was I not? No, it's the reverberation in the room for me. Oh, okay. Um, it, do, can you like just speak to um, the, I think, what is it, the visual um, spatial awareness um, with optic okay. gliomas? I mean, is that common in kids with? Well, I think that's Dr. Pan. I think you're ta there's vision and visual acuity. Then I believe you're talking about visual spatial deficits and um, yeah. that are common in NF1. Yeah, that's I'm just trying to Dr. figure Payne's out because Jennifer. my daughter's three and we can't get an accurate kind of assessment whether or not it's her vision, um, but she has like issues with transitioning 
you know, from like a floor to concrete, she sees lines in the concrete and she'll stop and she'll say, whoa, can't go down hills, I mean, stuff like that. So um, it's an important point because young children don't complain of visual loss. So if you were looking for problems with, with visuospatial awareness, not related to optic pathway glioma, what sort of things might the parent tell you their child was having difficulty with? Honestly, it's something that parents don't necessarily pick up. And uh, some of the more cognitive types of spa uh, visuospatial awareness difficulties. Um, but what you're describing, s uh, I'm, I'm, it doesn't sound typical to me of the sorts of problems that I see. They, they, they tend to be maybe a little bit clumsy when they're dealing with visual information, but some of those sort of gross difficulties that you're describing, I think, would be really important to have a, a vision checked as a first port of call and, and then, uh, you know, at three years of age, was it, that you said? Then... Yeah, she's three right now. Yeah, so, so it, I mean, a developmental assessment would be... Like We're in the job. midst of doing that as well, too. So. I, I want to stress something Dr. Ferner alluded to, but kids do not complain of visual loss. Now, if there's sudden visual loss, they will, but these, these tumors don't generally cause sudden visual loss. I always tell a story about a three-year-old who um, parents thought everything was fine until one day she dropped a Cheerio on the floor and instead of reaching down to pick it up, she was actually crawling down with her head literally right next to the carpet trying to find the Cheerio and that was the clue that there was something going on and her vision was horrible. Kids do not complain. Thank you very much for helping uh, us, uh, giving us that question. So, um, during the, my talk, I mentioned that sleep problems are extremely common. Um, and all the people who are jet lagged are not allowed to reply. But <laughs> do any of you or your children have uh, sleep problems? Would, would the gentleman there, would you like to tell us, could you possibly come to the microphone? Uh, yes, I'm not sure if it is NF related. Uh, but like I was just recently diagnosed with sleep apnea. And, and could you tell people, just so people understand what that means, could you tell them the sort of problems that you were having? Uh, so basically, I'd go to bed at a reasonable hour, wake up at a, about the right time, but I'd still feel like I got no rest, be dragging at work, and also as a migraine sufferer would do the bad thing. I would be mainlining caffeine all day just to keep myself going. So really unrefreshed in the morning, feeling quite jaded, lots of cafe, uh, coffee. Did, does anybody in your household say you snore heavily? Uh, yes, they do. And it's also genetic for my mother for the sleep apnea, so that's why I'm not yeah. sure if it is an app related. Well, People do snore very loudly. I mean, a lot of people snore, but this is very loud. Um, and Brigitte will tell you that um, platforms do that. Any comments on, on that for us? Yeah, so, it, so it, this, this can be, the snoring can be an issue in kids who um, have, you know, sometimes big tonsils, but it can also be tumors. Um, that are in the airway area. So that's for us always a question that we'll, we'll ask patients. Um, and you can have both at the same time. So we had one kid at NIH who had big tonsils, but also had a tumor that was right next to the airway. And that's very important, obviously, to know and then to be seen by an ENT doctor. Thank you. Uh, Vicky, any comments from a neurological point of view? Because there are a lot of things that cause uh, sleep problems. Uh, and I will take that question. So, so, as well as there potentially being neurofibromas obstructing the airway, I think that people with NF may just be more prone to normal sleep apnea or normal migraine. So, it's not necessarily it's a direct cause of a neurofibroma, but it's part of the condition. You know, perhaps having hypermobility or you know slightly sort of floppier airways or you know so on and so forth. So, I think that. Um, you know, having neurofibromatosis and other symptoms, there may be additional diagnoses that are related, but not, you know, the only diagnosis. So don't be put off going to seek, you know, medical attention for, for other issues. I think the other thing about, um, you mentioned sleep apnea, very often people 
don't realise, don't notice, they just feel tired during the day, and a lot of people feel tired, but morning headaches, loss of appetite, hypertension, all of these things can be symptoms of sleep apnea. Um, partners or people in the house may notice snoring or particularly these apneic periods, which means, you know, without breath, so a long pause in between breaths at night, and then people sort of slightly waking up with a big gasp, and, you know, but never quite waking, so the sleep is never deep and refreshing, it's all sort of superficial. Yes, I just wanted to share, we've had a lot of success with, um, we had some sleep struggles with my seven-year-old son, um, who also has significant issues with ADHD and hyperactivity and, and processing. And we took um, a very sensory approach to it and tried to implement some strategies. Um, previously, he had difficulty falling asleep. He'd wake up every hour on the hour, be up for good about 4 a.m. and be ready to go. Um, we started using a weighted blanket, and from day one, he now sleeps through the night, wakes up at a somewhat regular hour. Um, but I found that helping with the, 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 the sensory of it um, was very helpful for us. A personally. really, really important point, and um, for those of you who want to get more information, I'm sure this lady will talk to you, but also Mary um, is gonna, has got some basic things for sleep hygiene. Jonathan, any comments on, on what this lady's saying? Yeah, look, um, a, a lot of the kids that we see with ADHD do tend to have some sleep difficulties, so it's, it's, it's not unusual, unfortunately. And um, when it comes to, to medication, it's really important to, um, if a child is on stimulant medication, that it be titrated appropriately in the first place um, to avoid some of those sleep issues that can happen if, it, if it's not uh, introduced appropriately in the first place. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much to everybody for participating. Um, we've moved neatly on to a little break. Um, we've had a great uh, contribution from our very distinguished panel members, so I'd really like you to join me in thanking them.